Go ahead and open to James chapter 1. This is a, again, he's really got me in just teacher mode right now. And uh, here lately I've been making a statement that I've been challenged on just mildly, you know, a little bit by people. And uh, they mean well. <laughs> and what's funny, you know how Dave would, Dave would teach us that revelation knowledge is line upon line. We're always wanting to ask roof questions. And he says, you know, you, know, you got to pray the walls and the foundations first, you know. Well, I've been at this a long, long time, see. And so sometimes, uh, for example, we'll just take uh, James chapter 1, verse 21. And uh, when I'm using this verse, where, like, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. And I've been teaching on that a lot lately, because that's really the mechanism of righteousness. We could, I don't want to go back and teach that tonight. But when, when I say, uh, sometimes here lately, when I've said the engrafted word, I'll say, he engraved it. See, he engraved it right on your mind. And then nicely and gently somebody came and said, well, you do know that doesn't mean engraved. It means engrafted. I said, yeah, I know. And it said, but you're saying engraved. I said, well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and they're going, what? And I tend to forget. You know, because I'm going, I've taught this before. You know, I, 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 there's, there's lines in me, there's walls in me, and I've, I know I've taught it. And I'm thinking, well, you ought to already have that. You know, you know what to know what I'm talking about. But then I looked on my computer <laughs> to see when I taught it the last time. Um, 2002. <laughs> to me, it was a few weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> my dad used to warn me, he says, now as you get older, son, those birthdays, every time you turn around, it's your birthday again. You think they're lying. <laughs> Time seems to be speeding up. So I haven't taught this here since 2002, so many of you may not have been here, or it's been a spell. Let's, let's, do, a, let's do a lesson again on the engrafted word. That's the title for tonight. So the verse that we're talking about is verse 21, wherefore, James 1, 21, wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Plain English, that's the sin that you're still doing, <laughs> okay? Even though you're born again, you may have gotten rid of it. Your sin barrel may be almost completely empty now compared to what it was when you got saved, but there might still be a little bit near the bottom <laughs> or a stain or a residue, and he's saying, let's, let's get rid of all of it. Well, how do you do that? is receiving with meekness, and that means teachability, the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. And I know now what James, better than I ever used to, what James is talking about is the voice of your new nature. When Jesus told us we would walk, no longer walk in darkness, those that follow him shall not walk in darkness, John 8, 12, but shall have the light of life. This is the light of life. When you get that new nature, there's a, a conscience, a nature that comes on the inside of you, and it has a voice. Now, you may not hear literal words, but it works like your conscience works. Your conscience is an excellent communicator. If you're about to tell a lie, boy, that thing starts communicating with you, <laughs> and you know what it's saying, okay? Well, that's the way this new nature is. Now, it, the word engrafted literally does mean, I'll get to it in more detail in a minute, it means engrafting onto like a limb onto a tree. My dad used to love to play around with fruit trees. And he had this one tree. Went, now, he had one tree that for one season. Now, I may, I, if I remember correctly, I know it had three fruits. Apple, peach, and pear. I'm pretty sure those are the three. Because he kept playing with it. He, he did it so, a lot of times and it never would work. But he had one tree for one season. Now, it, because it's a... Uh, not natural. It didn't, re it didn't continue. It didn't, but, you know, engraft it. It's where you take one thing and you engraft it into another. That's literally what it's talking about. Okay. That's my introduction. Now, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 7. The Apostle Paul is drawing the contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. I'm going to go pretty quickly through these, so if you don't have time to keep up with, with everything, yeah, make a note of it and check it out later. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. 
But if the ministration of death, now he's talking about the old covenant where God had to deal with the spiritually dead people. If the ministration of death, now notice, written and what? Hmm. Written and engraven in stones. Now how did God, what do you mean engraved? Well, you remember from the Old Testament, he literally wrote on the stones with his finger. We're told how he did it. Wouldn't you call that pretty permanent? <laughs> and that's why it uses the word engraved. I like engraved. If, if I buy suit jewelry and I put on, I have engraved on that jewelry uh, bracelet or, or something, I love you forever, baby, mwah, mwah, mwah. See, I want it engraved in that metal. It'll be there 10 years from now, 20, it'll always be there. No matter how I act, you can look on that watch. <laughs> <No, I'm t> <laughs> <laughs> engraved, see, and we know God did that on tables of stone. No problem, right? So now the Greek word engraven there means the same as our English word engraved. It's permanent. So the first time God wrote his laws, he had to engrave them in stones because he could not engrave them upon the heart of a sinner. You got that? He had to put the law in those stones because the sinner's heart, he couldn't, he couldn't write on that. Now go to Hebrews chapter 1. Look at verse 3. Talking about Jesus. Who being the brightness of his glory and the, here's the, here's the, the express image of his person. And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The Greek word translated express image there in this verse is Strong's 5481. And believe it or not, it is the word character spelled with a K. It is from the same as G5482, which is a graver, the tool or the person, by implication, engraving. It is character. Another word would be like the figure stamped, like the emperors would put their image on a coin, and then you stamp out those coins, but every coin bears the image of Caesar. Well, preview, when you got born again, you got stamped with the image of Jesus. <laughs> On the inside of you, you received his character. You received his nature. And written in that person, that new man, from the get-go, God has already written his laws. And he's written his, on your heart and on your mind. You already have it. So it's engraved, it's permanent within that character of Jesus Christ. When you get born again, that character is what comes into you. And that's why you have a conscience that you didn't have before. I still remember that first week after I got born again. And it's coming against all my stuff. <laughs> my flesh stuff is going, this porno has to go. And I'm going, what? This alcohol has to go. What? Cigarettes, music. I'm going, what? Well, there's a new character. There's a new stamp. There's a new engraving on the inside of me. And it's got the law of God in it. And it's preaching to me. I don't have to go to tablets of stone now to find out, oh, uh, let's see, it's wrong to steal. Who knew? <laughs> no, no, no. It's on the inside of me. And get, get this, it is engraved. It is stamped like that coin. And I've got the image of Jesus on the inside of me. And it's engraved in you. It's permanent in there. It, it's not like a chalkboard. It's not going to change from day to day. It's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, see, I already had all that in me. So when I say engraved, I, I've already know that. <laughs> but now you know that, so leave me alone. Anyway. <laughs> so in Jesus Christ, we see the representation, the exact image of the Father's character. That's why Jesus said to Philip, you don't have to turn here, it's so familiar, John 14, 9. So Philip said, show us the Father. Just show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, have I been so long time with you and you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? 
I'm telling you where we're going, where the Holy Spirit is taking us, and it's not just us, it's the whole body of Christ. If he has his way, it won't be long you'll be saying, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. Now, how can you say that? You've been stamped. You've been engraved. You've been grafted. The life of God has been grafted into you permanently. And there's a life source flowing in you that did not exist before. Feet, stay here. <laughs> Start to do the Norval kick. Y'all remember the Norval kick? Anyway. <laughs> Glory to God. Mm. The aspects of this Greek word that describe the graver especially intrigue me. It seems to me that Jesus, that since Jesus is the exact representation of the Father, engraved in human flesh, and I'm talking about the Jesus that we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You want to see God? You want to see the Father? The Father has been engraved in Christ. If you see Christ, you've seen the Father. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Now God says, I am putting that exact image in you. I am engraving that same character in you. When people see you, it's like I've gone with a stamp, you know, like a, in metal. And when they see you, they see Jesus. Because he has engraved him in you. He has engrafted him into you. The life in that limb is now flowing in your limbs. <laughs> mm. Now going back all the way to Exodus, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but it's real familiar with Exodus 20 verse 1, God spake all these words saying, this is the chapter where he gives the law, I am the Lord thy God which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and then he says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Now get this, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. See, God forbade man from trying to make any graven image to represent what God was like. Man tends to become like what he worships. God knew that man had no way of knowing what God was truly like because man's viewpoint was distorted both by the death nature and the fallen state of the entire creation. So God forbade man from making a graven image to represent himself because the Father himself, he intended to provide the image. I don't want you trying to make it. You, don't, you wouldn't do it right. You don't know. But I'm going to provide the express image of myself. First, you'll get to see him. Remember our lessons in 1 John? We have handled. We have touched. We have seen. We have heard. But So in the beginning, it was just external. But they handled and saw and touched and, and heard the word of life. But that's not enough. God says, okay, that same life now, I'm going to stamp that same life on the inside of you. <laughs> at the new birth you got engrafted you got engraved you are made in that same image you went from the glory of the old covenant to the glory of the new covenant I like how, how Nathan's been saying it you are not some kind of old tree trying to bear new fruit you are a good tree that bears good fruit mm. I'm having a good time myself I got to teach in the morning I'm preaching tonight hmm anyway. <laughs> When man bows before the Lord Jesus Christ in worship, he now has the correct image to worship. And when he worships Jesus, he becomes conformed to that same image, the exact duplicate, the true representation of God. Again, man tends to become like what he worships. And as we behold the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, in worship, I, I'm going to add in the word, uh, praying in the spirit. But by all those means, as more and more you see him, you become conformed to that image. Now, in your spirit, you're already in, ha in that image. You're made in that image. Ephesians chapter 4 says that new man is created 
I would like to say from the get-go, instantly in righteousness and true holiness. But your soul is in the process of being renewed. See, be you no longer conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your spirit. Is that what it says? No, by the renewing of your mind. And as your soul begins to understand, even the very things we're talking about tonight, as he is, so am I in this world. I don't have to sin, sin. You have no dominion over me. And you start rising up into who you are. It changes your whole walk. And it won't be long. It'll seem just as ridiculous not to get people out of wheelchairs as it is then, now for you to go sin. Say, I don't, I don't fornicate. Don't you know who I am? I'm a good tree. And more and more, it's just going to be ridiculous that I would do anything like that. It's going to be a, just as ridiculous to leave a, leave a cripple in a wheelchair. It's going to be just as ridiculous. Okay. Not preaching really on that tonight. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 3.18. We're doing pretty good. <laughs> so 2002 to 2018, what is that, 16 years? I guess I should reteach it every 16 years or so. <laughs> I didn't realize it had been that long. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all, with open faith, beholding as in a glass, and the better translation there is mirror, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same, now notice, image. Jesus is the express image of God. In your spirit, you got born again and changed into that image instantly, spiritually. But in our soul, we are in the process of reprogramming, retraining. That's why God gave us not only a book, he gave us a teacher, the Holy Spirit. And he teaches us who we are as sons of the living God who we are as the image of Christ in our soul. And that's what changes your behavior, really. That's where you've got to receive with meekness. The soul is the part of you that has to receive with meekness that engrafted word. It's already been engrafted, starting with the new nature, which Dave would summarize. He'd say, basically, it's the Ten Commandments. It's, that's God's fundamental foundation, starting point, character. Don't steal, don't lie, you know, that's, that's, because God is love, he would never steal from B. He would never lie to B. He would never, to you or anybody else. That's his nature, and that's the first level. When you get born again, boom, that comes into you immediately at the new birth. Nobody has to tell you that it's wrong to steal anymore. You know it's wrong, okay? You already know all of this. But we are changed into that same image now, from glory to glory, spiritually, that happens instantaneously. You went from the glory of the old covenant to the glory of the new covenant when you got born again, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. But the transformation of the stove, the stove, <laughs> the transformation of the soul is not instantaneous. Have you found that out? We are to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We are to grow in the grace of God. We are to grow in the knowledge of God. Grow, grow, grow is all through there. It's like a little baby is born perfect. You know, the, the first thing you want to do is count the fingers and the toes. They, they pulled a trick on my daddy when I was born. They said, Carp, congratulations, it's a boy. That's the good news. The bad news is he doesn't have all of his toes on one foot. Dad went, oh. They said, not half his toes are on the other foot. So, Come on, lighten up. That's funny. <laughs> so I had, in other words, I had all the parts. I'm born in the image. I have, I have, but I'm a baby. My little tiny hand could not wield a hammer like my daddy. My daddy was a carpenter. Oh, here we go again with that thing. My, my dad, boy, that makes a lot of difference, doesn't it? My daddy was a carpenter back in the days where you used a 20-ounce hammer and I mean, you used it all day long. His forearms look like Popeye, you know? And I think of what his hand could do the day I was born. My little hand was like, you, 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 you little baby. The perfect little hand. Perfect. I'm made in the image. I've got all the parts. But there's some growth required before I can do what he does. We're in the growth we're in the growth part now. You've already been born again. You are accepted in the beloved. You have been made in the image. You've got all your toes and all your fingers, if you'll allow me. 
But we're just in that growth process, growing up and maturing in our soul so we're no longer conformed to this world. Glory to God. All right, that image, uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are changed into the same image. It says, I notice that the definition of the word character includes aspects that denote the graver, the tool, or the person. Smith Wigglesworth speaks often of God in the human vessel. Paul said the mystery of the gospel was Christ in us, our hope of glory. How does God inhabit the human vessel? Well, Jesus is the graver. Both in, he is both the person and the tool. He is the graver, the person, because it's only from him is it possible to receive the nature of God. When we are born again, it's the spirit of Christ that we receive. Through the grace provided by his finished works, he makes it possible for the very nature of God, let me say God's character, to be placed within our human flesh. If any man does not have the spirit of Christ within him, well, he's none of his. He's not even born again. There is no other path. There is no other religion. There is no discipline of man. There's nothing man can do to receive this engraving of God's nature other than receiving it directly from Jesus Christ himself. That's why he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There are not many paths to God. There is one path to God. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the graver in the sense that he is the only one from whom man can receive the nature, the character of God. But he is the graver, the tool, because the new nature is the very instrument God uses to engrave his own character upon our heart and our mind. Said another way, God has nothing else. Remember how Dave would say this over and over. God has nothing else but the new nature to use as a tool to engrave his life and character upon us. I'm, not, you can, I'm just going to read. This is so familiar. Hebrews 8.10. For this is the covenant that I will make in the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them. There it is. Write them. In the, the first time he wrote his laws, he engraved them in stone. The second time he wrote his laws, he engraved them in you. <laughs> and you received it when you received that, when that new nature was engrafted into you. When you were born again, that engraving comes with it. Because it is the very character of God. Is that good stuff or what? So to me it's the same thing when it says engrafted, engraven. I, I remember all of this. And I'm going, yeah, that's right. It's engrafted and it's engraven. <laughs> that's exactly right. Don't you remember the lesson? And they're going, when did you teach it? Oh, 2002. <laughs> well, now we can say 2018. Hallelujah. So God says, I will write them in their hearts and I, I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord they'll all know me from the least to the greatest you don't have to be a high and mighty in the church to know it's wrong to steal you don't have to be high in the church to know it's wrong to lie you don't have to be high in the church to love your neighbor isn't that right well all know him and he repeats it again in Hebrews 10 16 this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. It, it's, just, it's the new covenant. In the old covenant, he engraved tables of stone. In the new covenant, he, writes his, he engraves his law on your heart and on your mind. Glory to God. This nature, this character of God, is first apparent in the conscience of born-again people. The Gentiles that were born again under Paul's ministry had never been exposed to the written law of Moses. They didn't grow up hearing about Moses. They didn't grow up hearing about the law. But Paul preached Christ to them and him crucified. And when they were born again, they received this engrafting. They received this engraving from the get-go. And that new nature caused the character of God to be stamped, engraved in their hearts and in their minds. Suddenly... They did not need a written code to tell them not to steal. God's nature within them, through their conscience, told them not to steal, not to commit adultery, and so forth. That new nature brought the character of God within them, and it became a law unto themselves. Now here I'm, I usually say uh, Nathan, you know, Nathan chapter 2, 
But Nathan, I, I taught this in 2002, son. So sorry. But <laughs> Romans 2.14. You don't have to turn there. It's real familiar. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law. In other words, they were never taught the law. But they do by nature the things contained in the law. These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. Dave used to do that to me all the time. It, I'd, I'd get all excited about a revelation. I'd, I'd come busting in the office. And, Dave, have you ever seen this? And he was always so gracious. He'd go, Pat, 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 Gary. Oh, that is so good. And he'd give me my little attaboys. And, Man, that's really good. You wrote that good. And then after a little bit, he'd say, Now, you remember about 15 years ago? <laughs> and I'd go, Oh, yeah, you did teach that, didn't you? <laughs> Verse 15. No, let's read it all together. Romans 2, 14. Can you tell I'm excited? My job keeps me young. I'm telling you, you find your calling. You'll never work again the day of, another day in your life. I mean, you know, you, you just do it for free. I mean, you know, hallelujah. Romans 2, 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature, nature, they do by nature. They've got born again. They do by nature the things contained in the law. These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. See, I know that I know. I could, we, could, we could helicopter Doug Zanster, drop him off in deepest, darkest Canada. <laughs> they're, they're trying to get him up there. The, or, let's, okay, let's go deepest, darkest Congo, okay, or, or something. And, you know, where nobody, everybody there steals, everybody there lies, everybody sleeps with everybody. Doug Zanster will be a light in the darkness he will be no, no he won't have to go around asking is it wrong to steal is it wrong to, no he already has the law of God he is a law unto himself because God has engraved in him the image of Jesus he has engrafted into him the very character and life of God and that's the same I could say what I say about Doug I could say about any Christian amen you are the same hallelujah and that, which shows the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we will not be judged according to the written law of Moses. We just won't. We're going to stand in judgment for how well we obeyed the law of our new nature. So we're back to James 1.21. Let me just read it again. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. So the word engrafted here means... It is the practice of taking a limb from one tree and then grafting it permanently into a different tree. Sue brought to my mind another place where Paul talked about grafting. It says, Gentiles, this is in Romans 11, thereabouts, 10 or 11, 9, 10 or 11, right in there. He says, for you as a wild olive branch were grafted into God. That's another, that's a, that's a real good analogy right there. Same thing. But see, when you got born again, it's a little different. God takes, the, Jesus is called the branch. Did you know that? You, he engrafted that branch into you. You could say it the other way. You became engrafted into the branch. They're both true. He is the vine. We are the branches. And the imagery is this. The same life that flows through the vine flows through you. In that passage there in James 1, the real subject is how a person overcomes the temptation to sin. And it works the same for everybody. This is what I've been teaching recently called the mechanism of righteousness. And I want to remind you again, that teaching, the visual one, is at the website now, garycarpenter.org. And it's called the mechanism of righteousness. That message is much better seen than just heard because I use some visuals in it. But 
God gave us not just accounted righteousness. He gave a system, a mechanism of righteousness. That is the new nature. It's the voice that you hear from the inside. Yes, no, right, wrong, do this, don't do that. It's not the Holy Ghost. Now, the Holy Ghost comes with much more statistical type information that your new nature doesn't have. The Holy Ghost can say, go to a street called straight. Inquire of one Simon the Tanner and that type of thing, you know. But we're talking about the new nature right now. And you have, I've got to get that image. The sa I keep seeing this coin with Caesar's face. And it was stamped. You were stamped. You were engraved with the image of God. That's why Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm the image. And we're going to be saying, if you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. I've been stamped with the same image. God, that's the engraving right there, the stamp, the mark. Mm. So the word has been engrafted, implanted within us when we were born again. Because we received the very nature and character, the image, the engraving of God, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. God provided, he provided us the image. Remember he said, don't you guys try and make one. People did all, all down through history. Remember Dagon? I love the story of Dagon. I think it was the Philistines. One of them, they, they, they had, Dagon was a fish god. He looked like a fish. And at one point, they put the Ark of the Covenant in the same temple with Dagon. They come back the next morning. Y'all remember the story? Dagon was on his face. <laughs> ah, they propped him back up. Come in the next day, Dagon was on his face. Y'all remember the third day? Come in, Dagon's head was broken off. <laughs> there is no other way. There is no other God. That's why he didn't want us making any image. No, no. He, God says, I'll provide the image. Worship him. And you'll be conformed to that same image. God. So you have the law of God permanently engrafted in you. It is permanently engraved in your mind. Now, that's the good news. The bad part of that coin is this. None of us will ever be able to stand before God and say, I didn't know that was sin. The guy, the guy in Romans 7 could. He wasn't born again. He says, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't even have known coveting was sin. I wouldn't have known it was sin unless it said don't covet in your law. We don't have that same excuse. See, the, the radical grace people say that we are so forgiven that you, if you sin, you don't even need to tell God you're sorry. I bounced that off of Pastor Dave. I said, what do you think about that? <laughs> Dave, you know, in his usual loving, gentle way said, well, of course, we're the ones that should tell God we're sorry. Because we're the ones that didn't have to sin. <laughs> so simple. Just so simple. Mm. If you're, so being born again, we, we're never going to be able to stand before him and say, I didn't know that was sin. Yes, you did. It is engrafted in you. It is permanently engraved on your mind. And no man has to teach you now what is right and wrong. You have it within you. And you have become a law unto yourself. See, as that happens, that's how God can send you into deepest, darkest Canada. <laughs> Deepest, darkest Africa. Deepest, darkest Sepulpa. <laughs> he can send you anywhere. And because you've matured to the point you have become a law unto yourself. I hate to say this part, but not really. You think Jesus would have any problem if, now this, is, if this was possible? You think God would be worried about Jesus ministering in Sodom and Gomorrah? Would he be worried about Jesus being tempted and getting involved with that? See, that's ridiculous. It's just as ridiculous for you to think you can be tempted with sin. Or that you would fall for it. Everybody's tempted. But it's just as ridiculous because that's what he's trying to get across to us. See, I, when I think about that, I think, well, that's impossible. There's no way Jesus would ever mess with any of that. And God's going, that's the same image I put in you. You have got the same life in you that Jesus had in him. And when you come to maturity in that, I can send you anywhere. And you won't be 
You might, that tempt, your flesh is always going to be tempted, but you'll never give in to it. Why? You're going to receive with meekness the engrafted word. You're going to hear the voice of your new nature. I'll, more and more, where Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and the voice of a stranger I will not follow. This morning, the way that I, I didn't really have this in my notes, but this morning, the way he said it to me, just all of a sudden, this, he said, is your flesh your shepherd? You going to follow the voice of your flesh? The flesh is my shepherd. Maybe I'll want. He leads me to the bars and the prostitutes. Leads me to the drinking and to the drugs. Is that, is that going to be our psalm? No, that's what he meant. No, my sheep hear my voice. And he was really, I mean, really prophesying about the new nature. My sheep hear my voice. And the voice of a stranger, my flesh or the devil, I will not follow. That's not my shepherd. That's not my Lord. I'm not going to follow you. I like how Sue says, you are not the boss of me. For those of you that can't see me, I'm slapping my flesh. Tries to make me do something, tempting me. You are not the boss of me. You are not my shepherd. I don't follow you. And those that are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Those that are led by the new nature, they are the sons of God. Send you to deepest, darkest Catusa. <laughs> or wherever. God doesn't have to worry about you at all. Because you become a light. You become a law unto yourself. Glory to God. Okay, I'm going to quit there. Is that pretty good? Now, when I say engrafted or engraved, leave me alone. <laughs> Both of them are okay. I, I know what I'm talking about. And he says, receive with me meekness the engrafted word. Yes, but when you do, the reason you can do that, his word has been engraved in the new nature. So when you receive it, he engrafted it into you. Boy, it's engraved in your mind. Got it? Hallelujah. As my friend Joel would say. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and start the confessions now. We're a little bit early. I hope you're okay with that. If you're not okay with that, pray with me. <laughs> Forgive me. Love me anyhow. <laughs> I really appreciated Alan's message this morning. Alan, Alan is a champion of mine. He's a hero to me. And to go through the battle that he's going through and just stand up, spit in the devil's eye. I'm going to do what God called me to do. You're not going to stop me. I love it. But I am telling you, I'm prophesying again. You'll see the day where he walks like, like that never happened. It'll be like the, not even having, the, after this fiery furnace is over and he's come out the other side, he won't even have the smell of smoke on him. You'll never, people will think he's lying when he said he had a stroke. They won't, they won't hardly believe it. Now, that's going to come to pass. I'll see it with these eyes, and so will you. Okay, you ready? Say, Father, I worship you. I glorify you. And I praise you. You're not a man that you could lie. You have exalted your word above your name. Man, I want to teach right there. Heaven and earth will pass away. <laughs> but your word will never pass away. Therefore, I say, your glory is present at the prayer center. The blind see. The deaf hear. The lame walk. The dead are raised. And the poor, they have the gospel preached to them. Brother, do you need a copy of the confessions? Could you use one? Uh, I think we've got some right underneath the corner over here on this side was some anyway hallelujah and maybe they're gone <laughs> well all right, there you go I'm in the third paragraph a minimum of a thousand people are born again at the prayer center every week we have a minimum of 500 intercessors who are holding up the message that has come to maturity. We are able to get along with each other. 
while the Father works revival in our midst. We have that kind of worship that takes us beyond the veil of the flesh in order that we may worship in spirit and in truth. We worship you, Father, out of our new nature. And we give you family worship as your sons and daughters. Father, at the prayer center, those that come will see a people transformed to the nature of Christ. Father, we say, in the name of Jesus, no person ever leaves the prayer center the same way they came. Every person that comes receives a touch from the Good Shepherd. Father, those that come who are beaten down, discouraged, worn out, and tired, they won't leave that way. They'll be encouraged, strong, and mature. They'll leave standing upright, their shoulders squared, their heads held high, going forth as a mighty army to take this planet for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus. Father, your glory fills every service. Every person that comes drinks of your glory. They'll leave as earthen vessels filled with your glory. Filled with your wisdom. Filled with your love. Filled with your grace. And anointed by your spirit. They'll carry your presence with them. They'll carry revival around this world. Father, we declare. We preach your gospel. We'll never settle for man's gospel. Only yours. It's the gospel that saves. The gospel that fills. And the gospel that heals. That's why we say. Lost. Be saved. Empty. Be filled. Blind. See. Lame. Walk. Deaf. Hear. Maimed. Be whole. Dead. Rise again. In the name of Jesus. Father that's your gospel. We'll settle for nothing less. We're going for the gold. We have what we say. And we say at every service. The lost are saved. People are filled with the Holy Ghost. The blind see. The lame walk. The deaf hear. The maimed are made whole. And even the dead are raised. In the name of Jesus. Homer Betancourt, my good friend, says, we need to scratch out that and even. He said, it's no harder for God to raise the dead than it is to heal the sick. And I believe he's right about that. So the maimed are made whole. The dead are raised. In the name of Jesus. More than 12 legions of angels are loosed. To prepare the way for revival. Angels are dispatched. To the four corners of the earth. Intercepting and stopping. Every mission. And every assignment of the enemy. That would bring circumstances. Against those who would come. Angels are changing those circumstances. By rearranging them, causing money to come, and by changing schedules. We say, every person that is to be here will be here in the name of Jesus. There is no devil big enough, no assignment crafty enough, no circumstances bad enough. That will keep even one from being here. 
Father, we declare your house full. We've got an update about Tori here. Hang on just a minute. Hallelujah. We've been praying for Tori. Yes. The eye, got a picture here. The eye is almost completely normal now. Remember that eye that was bleeding? It was actually bleeding. It was so bad. And she's got a picture. Tori now, praise God. Hallelujah. No infection in Jesus' name. You mean God hears and answers prayer? Somebody should teach this. Anyway. <laughs> thank you, Father. Let's just praise him for a minute. Father, thank you. Thank you for touching Tori. Father, we just thank you and praise you, Lord. Now, Father, we're calling for the full manifestation. The full manifestation of the restoration of her natural mind. Where she can come and, and give testimony about what great things the Lord has done for her. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Said, Father, angels are dispatched now. Softening the hearts where hurts have wounded. Where calluses have formed. Where walls of defenses have gone up. Angels are softening the hearts. And creating atmospheres. Where the people can hear the voice of their shepherd. Angels are preparing their hearts now. So they're already receivers when they arrive. From the first word spoken. From the first song sung. From the first prayer prayed. To the end of every service. The people are free to receive from your spirit. The assignments of all devils against the prayer center, the people of the prayer center, and the leadership of the prayer center, all those assignments are dismissed in the name of Jesus. I declare those plans null and void. Devil, we're taking Tulsa from you. In fact, we already have. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Not you. We're an authority here. Not you. Devil, get out of Tulsa. Take all your demons with you. The King of Kings has made a decree. And I am speaking in his stead. The king has declared. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. The king has decreed. Captives. You are free. Every person returns to his original inheritance. That is the born again trail. Father you have restored our inheritance. At the prayer center, the inheritance is not just known about. We don't just teach about it, but it's received, manifested, and seen. Father, you have restored our fellowship with you. The firstborn told us to pray. Father, your will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. As in heaven, so on earth. As in heaven, so in Tulsa. There are no lost people in heaven. Therefore we say, Tulsa is saved. There are no sick people in heaven. Therefore we say, Tulsa is healed. There are no demoniacs in heaven. Therefore we say, Tulsa is delivered. And there's no poor people in heaven. Therefore we say, Tulsa is prospered. Tulsa is blessed. We declare every captive free. Every wheelchair emptied. All of them, no exceptions. Every artificial help. 
wheelchairs, crutches, canes, hearing aids, glasses, stretchers, bladder bottles. They may need them when they come. They won't need them when they leave. And we'll have them here as trophies to the glory of Jesus the healer. All manner of sickness and all manner of diseases are healed first time, every time, all of them, no exceptions. Jesus, you healed them all then. You healed them all now. That's what we say. That's what we have. In the name of Jesus. Father, there are impartations of your spirit. We declare these are the most powerful. The most anointed. The most life changing. The most revival producing. Services in history. Fresh anointings. Fresh giftings like never before. Since the book of Acts. Father, it's you doing the works. Therefore, all things are possible. Soul, my own soul, I command you. Believe this. All things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible. Things are possible. Things are possible. And every backslider will come back to God. They will never leave God again. So now, Father, in preparation, I forgive every person their trespasses against me. Father, forgive me all of my trespasses against you. I am freshly washed in the blood of the Lamb in order that my record in heaven be perfect. Therefore I say, because of the blood, what Jesus did for me, according to my record in heaven, I have never failed God. I lay down my life that the life of Christ may be manifest in me. I take no offense. I give no offense. And according to my record in heaven, I never have. At the prayer center, the mind of Christ is delivered to both the sheep and the shepherd. It is delivered with such simplicity and with such clarity that the wayfaring fool could not misunderstand it. Therefore, I say, the people at the prayer center and especially me, we all understand every word that Pastor Dave teaches. And we declare that Pastor Dave teaches. Every need is met, no matter how large, no matter how small. There are no cases too hard. There are no cases too late. Whatever they come for to receive from Jesus, they get it, all of them, first time, every time, no exceptions. I declare every captive free, free in spirit, free in soul, free in body, all are delivered, all are restored. Father, you are provider. Angels are dispatched to gather in all of the finances and everything that is required. Things we know about now, things we don't even know about yet, because you are the God who answers before we call. I speak against the strongholds of lack. And I declare an abundance. Abundance be in the name of Jesus. Therefore we say there is no lack. 
We operate from abundance. We operate from surplus. We have all in a bound with many baskets left over. We have such abundance. We can pay the way for many to come and many to go. And we send them out on prosperous journeys for God with abundance in a manner fitting for servants of the Lord. Our financial granaries are full. Get this revelation. Why were there 12 baskets full left after the feeding of the 5,000? Which says 5,000 men. Meaning, counting women and children, probably somewhere between 10 and 15,000 people. 12 disciples, 12 baskets. And when they got through, they gathered up the fragments. How many baskets were left? The lesson is, as long as you're serving from him, there is an inexhaustible supply. They had just as much at the end. Each one of them started with a basket full, ended with a basket full. If there had been 20 more thousand, they could have fed them just the same. There are no limits. Your father is an inexhaustible supply. We serve from abundance. So our, knowing that now, our financial granaries are full. Because our king has found stewards he can trust. What if one of the twelve, they received their basket full of, full of fish, they said, wow, it's all mine, and ran off. <laughs> Pretty sure when that basket got empty, it would have stayed empty. Stewardship. Good picture, isn't it? <laughs> because our king has found stewards he can trust. We're not going to run off with your baskets, Lord. I'm a good steward. So, Father, if you need anything, don't go to Rosie's house first. <laughs> Come to my house first. I want to be your steward. Whatever you have need of, come to my house first. All I need to know is my Lord has need of it, and it's yours. I've been bought with a price. I keep seeing that disciple running off with the basket. Anyway, <laughs> I've, I've never seen that before. I've got to go write that. See, when I get home, I've got to write that. I've been bought with a price. <laughs> my life is not my own. I am a first-class servant. It's funny. Lord, I lay all my possessions at your feet. And I say again, Lord, if you need anything I have, <laughs> it's yours. I love you, Lord, with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, all of my strength. And the second commandment is like unto the first. I love my neighbor as myself. And I'm going to, next time we do a revision, I'm going to revise that. I'm going to say it like this. I love my neighbor as you love me. Say it with me. I love my neighbor as you love me. That's our commandment now. See, that's our commandment. I love my good neighbors. I love my bad neighbors. I love my mean neighbors. And I love my enemies. Jesus, you are my Savior. You are my Lord. Whatever you ask, that's what I do. I am your servant. I am your bond slave by my own free will choice. And I serve you, Lord, by serving these people that you love so much. I serve the good people. I serve the bad people. I serve the mean people, and I especially serve your enemies, because you're trying to save them all, and you'd like to use me to do it. All that I have is yours. My time is yours. 
My body is yours. My family is yours. I own nothing. I am your bond slave. Use me as you will. You are provider for me, my family, and all that I have. And I am available for your use. We lift up the bloodstained banner over this city. Written in the blood of Jesus on the banner are these words. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Tulsa is in revival. Tulsa is in revival. <clears throat> and where Jesus is Lord, the Father's will is done. Father, have your way. Not just 30-fold. Not just 60-fold. But 100-fold. Again, I say, lost, be saved. Empty, be filled. Captives, go free. Blind, see. Deaf, hear. Lame, walk. Maimed, be whole. Dead, rise again. In the name of Jesus. Father, thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Forever, your will be done in Tulsa. Just as it is in heaven. As in heaven, so in earth. As in heaven, so in Tulsa. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Now shout about it. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. We have what we say in the name of Jesus. We have what we say. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, we saw today he hears and answers prayer. All right, just extend your, your faith this way. Maybe your hand. You don't have to repeat after me, of course. Father, every picture on this box represents an impossible case according to the world. Father, Tori's picture is on here. Right around here in the front somewhere. There she is, right there. Father, we're not praying for these people again tonight because you said that we were to believe that you heard us when we prayed. You said we were to believe we received when we prayed. Well, Father, we believe you heard us. We believe we received. And that means we shall see the manifestation of the miracle in every one of these cases in the name of Jesus. But now, Father, there's always new prayer requests coming in all the time. And Father, your word tells us that if we ask anything that's according to your will, we know that you hear us. And our confidence is, if you hear us, then we have the petition that we desire of you. Father, we're just adding our faith together with all of these. We thank you, Lord, for answering every single prayer that Jesus paid the price for them to have. And Lord, if a stranger sent in a prayer request here... Stranger meaning someone not yet born again, not yet in the family, not yet in the kingdom. That we don't care if they're atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, or anything else. Lord, if they had enough faith to send a prayer request here. And if that request is in line with your will, Father. We pray like Solomon prayed. Answer the prayer of the stranger. Father, do it in such a unique and unusual way. They will have to know it was you that answered that prayer. So they can know like we already know that you are the only true and living God. And they can hear and believe the gospel of your son and be saved. Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for every prayer cloth that goes forward from this place. Lord, we remember, began when that woman touched the hem of his garment, she was healed. Others heard about it, and they touched the hem of his garment, and they were healed. It became a point of contact for people. Father, and eventually from Paul's body, they took a aprons and handkerchiefs and cloths. And everywhere that they laid those cloths, your healing touch came. Father, we believe you're the same God today that you were then. Father, we thank you that the Holy Spirit saturates every one of these cloths with his di divine presence and anointing. 
we declare when we, those claws are laid on the sick, they will recover. When they're laid on those that have devils, those devils will come out in Jesus' name. Father, that means alcoholics will be delivered, drug addicts will be delivered, mentally ill people will be set free, wayward children will come to their senses, return to their parents, marriages will be put back together, Lord, and many, many other wonderful things you do like that because you have not changed at all and you are the same today. Father, we lift up Pastor Dave and Rosalie, Father, all of their house, not only in Oklahoma, but around the, the country. We lift up Tim and Leah Stemple and all of their house, Lord. Father, all of the ministers and their families, not only here, but those, Lord, that minister around the world. Yes, sir. Lord, we specifically, they, these are the ones we know are traveling right now. Jim and Kathy Martin are in Ireland ministering over there. Mark Cooper is in Peru. Um, Greg Boyd is in the Ukraine. Anyone else that you can think of right off? Nathan is in deepest, darkest North Carolina. Oh, my Lord. But, Father, we lift up all of them. Lord, you're just as much there as you are here. Your angels protect them there just like as if they were here. We'll see each one of them back here safely, and they'll come back bringing fruit from the harvest in Jesus' name. We're looking forward to it. Father, we declare no weapon formed against any minister associated with the prayer center worldwide or the congregations or the staff or the volunteers. No weapon formed against them will prosper. But everything that they set their hand to do will prosper in Jesus' name. And Father, last but not least, we're faced with another week. We've got the same number of hours. Each one of us has the same number of hours as any king or any president. If anything, the hours we have available to us might be more important than theirs because we're dealing with eternal things and not temporary things. Father, the time bandit is really good at what he does. Help us, Lord. Help us steward our time. We're going to stand before you one day and give an accounting of how we stewarded the life you gave us. When we stand there, we sure want to have the same testimony as Paul. We fought the good fight. We kept the faith. And we finished the race that you set in front of us. Lord, in our case, we know what that race is, and it is revival. Father, you will have your revival. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says, Amen.